Welcome to Lecture 11 of BIB 201, Bible Doctrines 1. Today we're going to be continuing through the section on views about the inspiration today. Continue where we left off. Number four, New Evangelicals. Letter I. The Bible is the Word of God, but love is the most important thing according to the New Evangelical view. So they do believe the Bible is the Word of God, but there's a heavy emphasis on love. In fact, many famous uh, theologians of today or church pastors of today consider themselves new evangelical, and they focus just on the love aspect while definitely denying the aspect of God's justice, which leads us to number, Roman numeral, or little ii. They believe and strongly emphasize tolerance and the end justifies the means philosophy. They take this approach because with love being the most important thing in their perspective, they do not confront individuals in their sin. They in fact kind of tolerate it because they believe if they can love on them enough, then that love will be what helps them conquer whatever issue or sin they're dealing with instead of actually confronting them in their sin. Some famous New Evangelicals of today are Rob Bell, Paul Rees, and Harold, Harold Okinga. Number five, conservatives or fundamentalists. Another word for this would be orthodox. Now, true conservatism is synonymous with fundamentalism, and a fundamentalism is one who believes in the fundamentals of the Bible, which we'll talk about in a second. The word, though, has been widely misused and has no real clear-cut meaning in theological language today because some have made conservatism synonymous with traditional style of worship. Many even avoid this term completely. And some have even taken fundamental and taken it and, and tied it into preferential issues. Many avoid that title as well. But what are the cardinal doctrines of conservatism, fundamentalism? Number one, full, the belief in the full inspiration of both the Old and New Testament. To be a conservative fundamentalist, you believe that both the Old and New Testament in its entirety was inspired by God. Then number two, the deity of Christ. A fundamentalist, a conservative, believes that Jesus was and is God. Number three, the virgin birth of Christ. Now you may be surprised about this, but there are many individuals who deny that Jesus truly was born of a virgin. That is still considered a fundamental conservative orthodox view of Christianity today, that Jesus was born of a, of a woman who had never had any sexual relations with a man. Number four, the sinlessness of Christ. If you believe that you are orthodox in your views, then you do not believe Jesus ever sinned. Then number five, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Now to break this down, substitutionary atonement means that you believe that Jesus atoned for your sins in your place so you would not have to. He was our substitute to satisfy the wrath of God. Just like in the Old Testament, a lamb was a sacrifice for our sins. You believe Jesus died as our substitute to atone for our sins. Then number six, the bodily physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you are orthodox in your beliefs, you do not believe that Jesus' resurrection was just a fable or a story. You do not believe that he only resurrected spiritually, not physically. You believe in the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus. Number seven, the final conservative view, orthodox view, is that you believe in the future physical advent of Christ. Just like when Jesus was born of Mary, that's considered the, the first advent or first coming of Christ, we also believe in a second advent, a second coming. Now what you have to notice here is what's not included is when that will take place. Because you can still be orthodox, conservative fundamental in your beliefs and disagree on the exact timing of when Jesus will return for his bride. Little I. I. Jesus was a conservative fundamentalist. Of all the different views we've talked about, Jesus would have fit most closely with the orthodox conservative fundamental view. How do we know that? Number one, he believed in the inspiration 
of Scripture. In fact, he taught that in Matthew 15 or Matthew 5:18 and Luke 24:44. He taught that every aspect of the Word of God was perfect and pure and last forever. Then number two, he believed in his own deity. Now, I gave you one example in Matthew 16 where he goes a step further and says not only was he God, but you must believe that he is God in order to be a part of his body, the church. But he taught over and over throughout the Old Testament, or excuse me, the New Testament and the Gospels that he and God were one. Then number three, he believed in the saving power of his own death and resurrection. He believed he was the substitutionary atonement for our sins, and he believed that his death and his resurrection would save mankind. Number four, he believed in the necessity of regeneration. Regeneration being born again, born from above. He taught this in John chapter 3 when conversating with Nicodemus and told him he must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. And then lastly, number five, he believed in his own future return. He didn't just believe it, he taught it. And he taught it as a way to provide comfort to his disciples that even though he was leaving, he was going to prepare a place for them so that when he came back, he would receive them unto himself. So that was a promise of not only preparing a place for us in heaven, but also that he would one day return for his children. And now that we've talked about the history of inspiration, let's talk about the mode of inspiration. Mode refers to the method that God employed in the inspiration of Scripture. How did he do it? Letter A, first thing to know is it's inexplicable. No one tr can truly explain how this happened since there is no record of how it happened. Now we have 2 Peter 1, 20, 21 that says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, but none of them recorded exactly what transpired for them to write the way they did under the inspiration of the, of, of the Holy Spirit. So it is inexplicable. Letter B, it was divine, directed, and organic. Divine meaning God had his hand in it. He's the one that was moving these individuals. Directed means God planned it. He orchestrated every single word that would be written down in a perfect way. And organic means that there's not one way in which all writers are forced to write. And organic means it was fluid. God used men and their vocabularies, their styles, and their experiences in expressing what God had to say to men and allowed it to be put on the paper we have today we call the Word of God. And the last thing we're going to talk about in today's lecture are false theories of inspiration. False theories. The first false theory I want us to focus on is something called natural inspiration. So well, what is natural inspiration? Natural inspiration believes in a higher development of the insight, which all men possess to some degree. And then they take it a step further and they say they believe that the Bible was inspired the same way other books were inspired. So this is a very general definition of inspiration, one that you would see with poetry, where someone said, I was inspired to write this. This is a false view because that is not the intent of being God-breathed. That is not a God-moving issue for us to write poetry. It's more of an emotional issue. Natural inspiration, therefore, is a false theory. Now let's look at letter B. Mystical inspiration. Now mystical inspiration believes that the writings of scriptures was accomplished by an intensifying and elevating of the religious perceptions. This is more like a, a you know trance where you are transcending reality and getting some kind of higher insight and elevated religious perception. Then number two, this view also believes that all Christians of every age are inspired as much as Paul, Moses, and the other biblical writers. The issue with this one is, if we are all inspired the same way the biblical writers are, then A, our writings and our beliefs should be just as directive and, and canonized as the other writers like Paul and Moses, or Paul and Moses' writing is technically not to be as canon because they were just men and they're fallible. So either way you look at this, the mystical inspiration is not a correct theory of inspiration. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 11 for BIB 201. 
Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact me.